Princess Victoria, the original Queen Mother. Queen Victoria was known as the Grandmother of Europe, but her own mother was also a titan with scandalous romances and disturbing parenting. Princess Victoria of Saxe Coburg, Saalfeld, is one to learn about and how she moulded the future monarch of England. Please continue to support my channel by subscribing. She was born into privilege before she gave birth to one of the most characteristically British monarchs the world has ever seen. Although her roots were very much not British, as she was German. She was born in 1786 to her parents, Franz Frederick, and her mother, Countess Augusta who were luminaries of the Teutonic House of Saxe Coburg in Gotha. This was a highly privileged family and they placed high expectations on their child. They controlled much of her life and by the time she was 17 years old, they had married her to a man whom she had little to no decision in, the powerful Charles, Prince of Leningen. This man was two decades older than her, so I doubt he would have been her first choice for a groom. He was widowed, and in a strange turn of events, his prior wife was none other than her own aunt, making for an awkward reunion. It was her obligation as a wife to produce children with this man, despite the considerable age gap between the pair. She did become pregnant the very first year, at just 18 years old. She gave birth to a boy, Prince Karl, and then another daughter, Theodora, three years later. Victoria was barely in her twenties and already a mother of two, but she had higher ambitions for herself and she wished to become as powerful as possible. Whatever disappointments Victoria's life had on the private front during these years, they definitely didn't show in public. It was her brother's choice in bride that would gain the family direct access to the British throne. Her brother Leopold married Charlotte, the Princess of Wales, who was the future heir to the throne, until one day it all came crashing down. In the summer of 1814, Victoria's much older husband, Prince Charles, passed away. She was left alone with two children, but if anyone could handle dire situations alone, it was her. It wasn't long before she became the regent for her son, Carl, though this was only foreshadowing for her much bigger role in royalty. Just as Victoria had gained momentum in her life again, after losing her husband, an event that should have been filled with celebration for the birthing of an heir for her brother and the Princess of Wales, turned into a tragedy when the Princess gave birth to a stillborn son. Shortly afterwards, the Princess hemorrhaged and died, leaving behind a devastated Leopold who was heartbroken over the loss of his wife and child. England was utterly panicked about the loss of its heir. This prompted an enormous succession crisis and Victoria was right in the middle of it. In the tragic aftermath of the Princess of Wales' death, an heir to the throne, Britain were desperate for an heir to take over the crown. All of the surviving male heirs of the current and ailing King George III were either in miserable, childless unions or were lifelong bachelors. Parliament made a desperate attempt to pay these men to settle down with a woman in the hopes that they could produce a healthy heir for the crown. So how does Victoria come into this quest for an heir of England? Her brother was already connected to the crown through his wife, she was introduced to Prince Edward, the Duke of Kent, and one of the sons of King George III. He proposed to her with the understanding that she would give him an heir for the crown, and she accepted with delight, 
This heir would be none other than Queen Victoria, the future monarch of the UK. Princess Victoria had little luck with men, it seemed, and this holy matrimony was no different, and it was full of scandals. Victoria's engagement to a prince of England seemed like happily ever after on the outside, but inside was a whole other story. Prince Edward was one of the bachelors that had refused to settle down before, and there was good reason for it. He was used to living the high life with the high state gambling tables, where he had catapulted himself into a world of debt. The newly wed Duke and Duchess of Kent were so broke they decided to go and live in Germany after their wedding in order to keep their costs down. Only a twist of fate was in store. She had become pregnant quickly, providing Edward with the heir he wholeheartedly desired. They rushed back to England so that their British heir was born in the country to which she would rule. In the spring of 1819, they moved into Kensington Palace to set up Victoria's brood nest, and a month later, history was made. The country had been waiting on an heir for their crown, and Victoria was able to give them just that, when she birthed a little girl who they named Princess Alexandrina Victoria of Kent, the future Queen Victoria of England. Although her life should have been filled with rejoicing, it wasn't long until tragedy hit her life again. Only eight short months after the birth of their baby, her husband Edward passed suddenly from pneumonia. In quick succession, further tragedy struck, and only six days later, his father, King George III, also passed away. The British throne was crumbling rapidly, and Victoria was yet again widowed at such a young age, with a young royal heir to nurture by herself. It would have been tempting for the young Duchess of Kent to have returned to her home in Germany, especially as she did not speak the language. She had a privileged life in a palace in Coburg that she could have escaped to, but instead she played a different hand and it paid off for her. She had always been power hungry, perhaps due to the high expectations that were put on her as a child, and how she had never found true love, but only gained husbands through political game playing. She placed herself firmly in England and rolled the dice on her daughter's future, in the hope that she would one day gain the ultimate power over Europe. But unfortunately for her, her ride was not a smooth one to power. When she announced she would be staying in England, the people were not impressed. Her husband had left behind a mountain of debt, and so she requested that Parliament pay for her extravagant lifestyle, for her and her precious heir. They were not happy about this arrangement, and the solution they provided was downright insulting. They provided her with a poverish and decaying room in Kensington Palace. She shared this life with a whole bunch of other downtrodden nobles who had fallen in hard times, proving just how little they thought of the princess and her heir. I doubt this was the welcome she was expecting and one she probably felt she did not deserve, but by then she had bigger things to worry about. Victoria was outspoken on her plans for power, corruption and lies, and it didn't take long for her to make more rivals in the royal court. In 1830, she got herself in trouble with those with the most influence in the court. The year the king passed, she had made enemies with his successor, his brother, William IV. He was perhaps bitter of the Duchess and her ability to provide the heir of England that he was never able to, and she made sure to use this to hold him over a barrel. William was elderly and had still not produced any legitimate children. His only option was to rely on this overzealous Duchess and her daughter to keep the line going. 
Their feud went both ways. King William had produced loads of illegitimate children with one of his mistresses, Dorothea Jordan. Victoria was disgusted by the debauched behaviour of William and she refused to visit the English court because of it. She was so against the king, she refused her daughter to attend his coronation. This was supposedly because she didn't like the way that they were going to place her in the proceedings. The ceremony would not be about her and so her excuses did not go unnoticed branding her with a reputation for self-entitlement. She was able to use the air she had produced to act like the woman of the hour and her feud escalated with William when she refused to acknowledge the letters from his wife, Adeline. Not only did she refuse to stand with her at the horse stables, instead demanding that she stood alone, she was also horrifically rude. Duchess Victoria flexed her air in front of the British court often, rubbing her ability to bear children in the face of Adelaide, who despite years of trying for a child, could not produce due to being too old. Her desire for power and control began to show with her own daughter and she began to exhibit disturbing behaviour with her too. The famous stories of how Queen Victoria was brought up as a child are no myth and the Duchess of Kent, who was used to getting her own way, controlled every little aspect of her life. This was when the famous Kensington system was born and the bitter relationship between Victoria and her daughter began. The Kensington system was designed to keep young Victoria as far away from everyone as possible. The Duchess forced the girl to sleep with her every night, refused her nearly all playmates except for the family dog and put her under a strict tutoring regime to turn her into the perfect ruler. Oh, and she especially kept the girl away from King William's side of the family. She did not do this alone. She had a partner in crime who had become one of the most hated men of Queen Victoria upon her reign. Duchess Victoria and her beloved partner John Conroy also had a huge hand in building it. Conroy took on the system as his own showing even more devotion to it than the Duchess herself. Unsurprisingly, nearly everyone in court hated Conroy too, and he earned the spiteful nickname, King John, for all of the influence that he thought he had. The partnership of the Duchess and Conroy turned dark, and it is alleged that they were lovers too, despite him being married. Pretty hypocritical considering her distaste to the prior king's debauched affairs. They would try to come up with new ways to control and direct the little monarch to be. The Kensington system was set up as a ploy to keep little Victoria under their control so they could gain a powerful regency over the country. Her hope was Victoria would become queen before the age of 18, meaning she would need a regent by her side. The pair were ruthless with their plans, pressurising her into more and more events that led to little Victoria's collapse. Conroy and the Duchess forced the princess to attend a gruelling tour of England, visiting town after town to drum up support for her coronation. The tour was a success, but it left Victoria feeling hateful and fatigued with the constant travelling before she ultimately begged her mother to stop the tour. In October 1835, the exhausted 16-year-old girl fell ill. Her mother and Conroy had little sympathy for the girl, instead believing she was faking it. She was getting more and more ill and in her weakened, vulnerable state. Her mother tried to get her to sign over the role of private secretary to the man who had tormented her for years under the strict Kensington system. Luckily, it didn't work. Even in her poorly state, she did not trust this man at all. 
The Duchess didn't like being in close proximity to King William IV, but the monarch had noticed how she was manipulating the young Victoria for her own gain, and he was not happy. In his way to approach the topic, he did so dramatically when on his 71st birthday banquet in 1836, William silenced the room and uttered a shocking speech. At the banquet in front of many luminaries, he began his announcement with a promise to living for nine months longer, so that little Victoria would turn 18 under his rule and deny her mother the regency. He was absolutely not willing to give one inch of power to this cretin of a woman and he made everybody else aware. This led to the public humiliation of the Duchess, continuing his speech with, if I lived to the girl's birthday, I should then have the satisfaction of leaving the exercise of the royal authority to the personal authority of that young lady, heiress presumptive to the crown, and not in the hands of a person now near me, who is, herself, incompetent to act with propriety in this situation. The reaction to William's announcement was bedlam itself. It was very out of character for a royal to address a private feud so publicly, and so the Duchess must have tipped him over the edge for him to deliver the final blow. Little Victoria started sobbing with her mother unwilling to comfort her as she stood stone-faced, refusing to move for a while, before leaving the court the next day. This promise that was made by the king, he stuck to it, and on the 20th of June 1837, something miraculous happened. On this day, only one month after his niece, Victoria, turned 18, this man's hate for the Duchess willed him to live on to live past her gaining regency to his throne via her daughter. The Duchess must still have been over the moon that her daughter was now the powerful Queen of England, and she could now continue to manipulate her, how she had always done before. But this is not how it worked out. The Duchess panicked, and her and Conroy came up with a plan that the young Victoria would extend her regency until the age of 21. The appointed queen-to-be was having absolutely none of it, instead choosing to rebel against her mother completely. Her daughter's coronation to the throne brought about her downfall, rather than her quest for power. She had been suppressed under the strict Kensington system, and control of her mother and Conroy, of whom she despised, and her first act as queen was to dismiss Conroy from her household. Then it was her own mother's time to pay for her sins and behaviour, when she was also banished. She banished her mother to the far rooms of Buckingham Palace, relegating her to the rooms furthest away from her, much to the shock of the court, who presumed she would stay loyal to her mother, who was still unmarried, but Queen Victoria was bitter over her mother's treatment of her. Queen Victoria had banished Conroy from her life, but this did not stop the Duchess and him plotting to remain control once again, when she kept him as part of her household in the remote rooms of the palace. This went on for a further two years before her ally was finally exiled. In 1839, the palace finally convinced Conroy to leave England and to go far away from both the Duchess and the Queen. With Conroy gone, you would imagine that things would get better, but the past cannot be erased and the damage was done. All that was left was a rift between the older and younger Victorias, and it would nearly take the rest of the Duchess's life to mend it. But their reconciliation proved more heartbreaking than anything else. The pair would grow closer slowly over the years, with Conroy out of their lives, but she did not become a trusted member of the household, until the Queen gave birth to her first child, 
and the women had a heartfelt reconciliation. And the Duchess became a doting and not a meddling grandmother. In 1854, the Duchess lost one of the most important people in her life, and that was Conroy himself. That year, he passed in Wales while deeply in debt, causing the news to reach the Queen, whom reacted in a sweet rather than bitter way when she wrote to her mother when she stated, Divisions between you and me, which could never have existed otherwise, they are buried with him. She wrote back to her daughter, defending him, scrawling, I shall not try and excuse the many errors that unfortunate man committed, but it would be very unjust if I allowed all of the blame to be thrown on him. When Conroy passed, the palace made a disturbing discovery when the numbers he had meddled with at the palace did not add up. It was revealed that he had been taking significant sums of money from her. She was, unbeknown to her, another victim of his. By the 1860s, the Duchess was in her 70s. She had become a grandmother many times over. She was in poor health and she spent her years near Windsor Castle in Frogmore House. This happens to be the place where Prince Harry and Meghan Markle had their wedding reception. It was here her health declined further and the end was near. Queen Victoria was a carrier of the sickly blood clotting disease, but it is a mystery of where this came from, as no one before her had it. This is where the rumour that the Duchess of Kent had an affair, and that Queen Victoria was the love child with that mystery man. There is one more piece of evidence for this theory. Another royal disease was porphyria. This had been prevalent in her ancestors, especially in her grandfather, Mad King George III. This disease failed to be passed on after Victoria, but haemophilia rose instead. Did the Duchess portray a legitimate heir of England, or was she the product of a steamy affair? It is unlikely that a carrier of haemophilia was the Duchess's lover, as he wouldn't have lived long enough into adulthood before he died. It is a possibility that the Duchess was the one whom passed this fatal disease on to her daughter, since it is a random mutation in 30% of cases. On March 16, 1861, the 74-year-old Duchess of Kent took her last breath after a lifetime of drama. The relationship with her daughter strengthened with each passing year, and Queen Victoria was still at her side when she passed, holding her hand. Her letters held even more drama that the Queen snooped on upon her death. Maybe she was going to finally get closure on her mother's behaviour over the years. What she found during her snooping broke her heart after many distant years with her mother. It was finally revealed in her mother's letters just how much she really loved her daughter. She was so happy that they were able to reconcile their relationship and Queen Victoria placed the blame for her mother's cold-heartedness on Conroy for wickedly driving them apart. <laughs> Queen Victoria's father, Prince Edward, Duke of Kent and Strathern, was a remarkable figure in British history. Born on the 2nd of November 1767, he was the fourth son and fifth child of King George III, but his legacy extends far beyond his royal lineage. In 1799, Prince Edward was bestowed with the prestigious titles of Duke of Kent and Strathern, as well as Earl of Dublin. This marked a turning point in his life, propelling him into positions of great importance and influence. Shortly thereafter, he assumed command as a general and became the commander-in-chief of British forces in the maritime provinces of North America. This strategic appointment showcased his military prowess and leadership skills. 
The Duke's journey took an adventurous turn when he became the first member of the royal family to reside in North America for an extended period. From 1791 to 1800, he immersed himself in the vibrant cultures of the New World, fostering a unique understanding of the land and its people. In fact, in 1794 he achieved yet another groundbreaking milestone by becoming the first prince to set foot in the United States, embarking on a remarkable journey from Lower Canada to Boston on foot. During his time in North America, Prince Edward made an important contribution to the cultural and linguistic fabric of the region. On the 27th of June 1792, he coined the term Canadian to encompass both French and English settlers in Upper and Lower Canada. This momentous act of linguistic diplomacy aimed to bridge the divide between the two groups and it occurred during a riot at a polling station in Charlesburg, Lower Canada. Consequently, he earned the enduring title of the father of the Canadian crown, symbolising his profound impact on the development of Canada. Prince Edward's illustrious career continued to flourish upon his return to Europe, and in 1802 he was appointed Governor of Gibraltar, a position he held until his untimely death in 1820. Throughout his life, he demonstrated a deep commitment to the armed forces, culminating in his appointment as Field Marshal of the Forces in 1805. Although Prince Edward's time on earth was tragically cut short, his legacy endured through his only child, Victoria. Seventeen years after his passing, Victoria ascended to the throne and became the iconic Queen of the United Kingdom. Thus his spirit lives on, forever intertwined with the pages of history. Prince Edward made his grand entrance into the world on the 2nd of November 1767 as a cherished offspring of King George III and Queen Charlotte. Being fourth in line to the British throne, his birth held great significance for the royal family and the nation. Coincidentally, he was named after his late uncle, the Duke of York in Albany, who had recently passed away and was laid to rest at Westminster Abbey on the eve of Edward's arrival. The young prince received his baptism on the 30th of November 1767 in a solemn ceremony that united him with his godparents. These esteemed individuals included the hereditary Prince of Brunswick, Lunenburg, who stood as a proxy for his paternal uncle through marriage, the Earl of Hertford, the Earl of Huntingdon, and who acted on behalf of Duke Charles of mecklenburg strelitz Edward's maternal uncle, and the hereditary Princess of Brunswick, Wolfenbüttel, represented by a proxy due to her absence. Additionally, the Landgraving of Hesse Castle, Edward's paternal grandfather's sister, found her presence replaced by the Duchess of Argyll, who served as Lady of the Bedchamber to the Queen. This baptism marked a significant moment in Prince Edward's early life, as it connected him to a network of influential figures and established his place within the royal lineage. Prince Edward embarked on a distinguished military career that spanned continents and made a lasting impact on history. He began his training in Hanover in 1785, but changed plans upon the advice of the Duke of York, pursuing military education in Hanover. At 18, he became a brevet colonel in the British Army and continued his education in Geneva. He joined the influential Masonic Lodge de Lunion. In 1789, Prince Edward became Colonel of the Royal Fusilers. However, missteps led to his exile to Gibraltar as a regular officer. In 1791, he transferred to Quebec, becoming the first royal to tour Upper Canada. Prince Edward rose to Major General and displayed courage during the battle and in Halifax, Nova Scotia, where he served as Commander-in-Chief of the Royal Navy's North American Station, he shaped the city's military defences and transformed a residence into an enchanting prince's lodge. After a fall from his horse in 1798, he returned to England and was granted prestigious titles, along with the role of Commander-in-Chief of British forces in North America. 
Appointed governor of Gibraltar, his strict discipline caused a mutiny, but he refused to return to England until his successor arrived. He was promoted to field marshal and appointed ranger of Hampton Court Park, and Prince Edward balanced military discipline with friendliness, supporting social experiments and advocating for Catholic emancipation. Prince Edward's career showcased his passion for military service, his impact on various regions and his commitment to social causes. Following the untimely death of Princess Charlotte of Wales in 1817, the British royal succession faced uncertainty. The Prince Regent George IV and his brother Frederick, Duke of York and Albany, were estranged from their wives and had no legitimate surviving children. The King's daughters were childless and his unmarried sons rushed to secure marriages to ensure an heir to the throne. Among them was Prince Edward, Duke of Kent. At the age of 50, Prince Edward sought a suitable marriage partner and became engaged to Princess Victoria of saxe coburg salfeld the sister-in-law of his late niece, Princess Charlotte. The couple married on the 29th of May 1818 at a palace in Coburg and had a second ceremony on the 11th of July 1818 at Kew Palace in Surrey. Princess Victoria was the daughter of Francis, Duke of saxe coburg salfeld and the sister of Prince Leopold, who had been married to Princess Charlotte. She was a widow, having been previously married to Emmett Carl, second Prince of Lenigan, with whom she had two children. On the 24th of May 1819, the Duke and Duchess of Kent welcomed their only child, a daughter named Alexandrina Victoria. The Duke took great pride in his daughter, even predicting that she would one day become the Queen of the United Kingdom. Throughout his life, the Duke of Kent had various reported mistresses. While in Geneva, he had relationships with Adeline Dubas and Anne-Marie, Madame de Saint Laurent, also known as Julie de Saint Laurent accompanied him to Canada in 1791 and remained by his side for 28 years until his marriage to Princess Victoria in 1818. Despite claims of descendants from these relationships, thorough research has confirmed that no children were born from any of these unions. Prince Edward's marriage to Princess Victoria solidified his place in the royal succession and eventually led to the birth of Queen Victoria, one of the most significant monarchs in British history. In his later life and in 1801, the Duke of Kent acquired Castle Hill Lodge in Ealing, West London, purchasing it from Maria Fitzherbert. Architect James Wyatt was enlisted to enhance the property and over a hundred thousand pounds or 8.1 million in 2021 was invested in its renovation. Notably, the Duke's neighbours from 1815 to 1817 were John Quincy Adams, the future US President, and his English wife, Louisa. Adams documented attending church with the Duke of Kent and hearing a sermon by Dr. Crane in August 1815. After the birth of Princess Victoria in 1819, the Duke and Duchess sought a cost-affected residence to manage their significant debts. They opted to lease Warbrook Cottage, situated by the seaside in Sidmouth, Devon. They intended to keep a low profile during their stay. Tragically, the Duke of Kent succumbed to pneumonia on the 23rd of January 1820 at Warbrook Cottage in Sidmouth. He was laid to rest in St George's Chapel at Windsor Castle, and his passing occurred just six days before the death of his father, King George III, and less than a year after the birth of his daughter. As the Duke predeceased his father and elder brothers, and none of his elder brothers had surviving legitimate children, his daughter Victoria ascended to the throne following the demise of her uncle King William IV in 1837. She went on to reign until 1901. In 1829, the Duke's former aide acquired Castle Hill Lodge from the Duchess in an attempt to alleviate her financial burdens. The debts were ultimately settled after Victoria assumed the throne and gradually paid them off from her own income. Please continue to support my channel by subscribing. Please comment, like and subscribe if you wish for more stories and leave your suggestions below and I will endeavour to cover them.